جزاكم الله خيرا بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, Once again, for those who were here for the previous portion Alhamdulillah, it's good to be able to continue And um, for those that are just joining us uh, once again, welcome everyone, and it's really good to have you here today, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be able to address you and for listening attentively. Uh, I said in the previous session that, you know, it's uh, really interesting, uh, you know, the Prophet wasallam he tells us in authentic narration, Hadith of Bukhari, that the Prophet wasallam used to like looking for good signs. And the Prophet ﷺ would constantly look for um, positive signs. And so, you know, I was saying that it's very uh, encouraging that we kind of are coming into the new calendar year uh, on a blessed day of Friday. A day of blessing, a day of mercy, a day of light, as the Prophet ﷺ says. And so with that, I wanted to spend... A little bit of time here today, kind of talking about because at the end, of, you know, once again, the calendar year, you know, is something that we use to, you know, kind of track time to separate uh, different things to be able to work towards some goals and then be able to assess how things went and then be able to set goals further out and so on and so forth. So it does make a lot of sense here for us at this juncture to be, to talk a little bit about what are ways that we can be more spiritually productive and that we can grow spiritually and that we can improve ourselves and improve our condition during this coming year that we have in front of us. So I've laid out a few points that I'd like to touch on that I'd like to talk about. Number one is gratitude. We just touched on it in the previous session as well. But gratitude. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ That if you thank me, if you are grateful, Allah says, لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ that I shall increase you, Allah says. وَلَئِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٌ But if you are ungrateful, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that know for a fact that my punishment is very severe. فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ That's why Allah tells us, remember me and I shall remember you. وَشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ And be grateful to me and never ever be ungrateful to me. So gratitude is very important. And one of the big lessons, as I see a lot of the people, you know, even in my own life and, you know, my own family and circle of friends, and even I see somewhat online, people are sharing a lot of the lessons that they learned over the previous year. And there's a lot of emphasis put on gratitude. People really learn to recognize and note and appreciate and be grateful and thankful to Allah for all of his blessings during this year. Well, we got to remember that lesson that we learned and we got to remember to be grateful. It cannot just be something that we kind of have a thought about after the fact, but it has to start being something that we operate with. And so gratitude is the very first thing. Recognize, note, observe, remind yourself, write down, repeat the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the things that you are grateful for in your life. Whatever that may be your family, the roof over your head, the food on your plate, you know, the, 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 the socks that you use to keep your feet warm. SubhanAllah, I was, you know, um, helping out with this, uh, fun, this fundraising campaign, um, Relief, this, this one humanitarian organization, Relief Work, they were doing. And one of the items on the list that they were, save, that they were collecting money for was to buy socks for kids who are in very cold places in refugee camps. And I said, subhanAllah, socks. Like who remembers to say, alhamdulillah, thank Allah, and reflect on the blessing of having socks on your feet? SubhanAllah. So there's a lot to be grateful for. Number two, 
make good intentions. See, irada, niya is typically the word that we associate with intention. I'll, you know, that I'll get to that in just a moment. But irada just means irada tul khayr, like to just aspire to do good, good aspirations. That is a very fundamental part of the recipe for success that the Quran tells us. Man kana yuridu harth al-akhirati nazid lahu fi hartihi. Whosoever always aspired to good in the life of the world, Allah says we will increase their lot in the hereafter. We'll give them more in the hereafter. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ Whosoever aspired to succeed in the life of the hereafter وَسَعَالَهَا سَعَيَهَا And then did some efforts in that regard. Even if their efforts fell short of where their aspirations were فَأُولَئِكَ كَانَ سَعَيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Allah appreciates their efforts and Allah will reward them. So have, making intentions, having good aspirations, setting up goals for yourself very important. That's number two. Number three is dua. We have to be making dua all the time. Everything we've talked about. Oh Allah, Allahumma inni as'aluka, like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us a dua, that oh Allah, grant me the ability ala shukrika wa husn, wa, ala shukrika. That, oh Allah, grant me the ability. Allahumma inni ala, uh, uh, ala shukrik. Oh Allah, grant me the ability, help me, and allow me to be more grateful to you. So we want to be grateful. We want to be grateful. Well, what we have to do is that we also work towards being grateful, but we also ask Allah, oh Allah, qalban shakira. Oh Allah, grant me a grateful heart. Lisanan shakira. Well, Allah, grant me a grateful tongue. Make me a grateful servant and slave. Min shakur. Allah says in the Quran, very few of my servants are able to be grateful all the time. Well, Allah, make me one of them. We talked about having high aspirations, making intentions, setting goals. We say, oh Allah, grant me him. Grant me aspirations and spiritual strength and conviction. Well, Allah grant me spiritual courage and allow me to live up to those aspirations. Well, Allah allow me to work towards achieving those goals. But we need a lot of dua. Number four is consistency. I know that that probably sounds cliche, of course, be consistent. No, no, no. But what I mean by that is whether it's, you know, we spend a minute or two minutes counting some blessings of Allah, mentioning some blessings of Allah, noting some blessings of Allah. One of our um, instructors, Qalam Musada Atifa, she always talks about, you know, people keeping a journal. And so having like this gratitude journal where you just spend a minute every morning. You pray Fajr and then you take your journal and you spend a minute writing down things that you are grateful for. And so whatever it is, this gratitude, making good intentions, like reminding ourselves, goal setting, what our objectives are, what our goals are, be consistent with that. Dua, be consistent with it. That at night when I go to when I'm about to go to sleep, when I lay down in my bed, when I sit by the side of my bed, for five minutes before I go to sleep, I'm just gonna make dua to Allah. Instead of scrolling through my phone while I fall asleep, I'm just gonna make dua to Allah. But consistency, as the hadith of our mother Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says the Prophet said, Excuse me. That the best of deeds, the best of affairs, the best the best of actions are the ones that are done the most consistently. Even if they be very small in terms of quantity, but the quality is great and they are you are consistent with it. Number five. Sincerity. 
And that obviously brings up the topic of niyyah that I talked about. That is the sophistication of those aspirations, the development of those aspirations, the refining of those objectives and aspirations. And where it actually becomes a sincere intention. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Mukhlisin alahuddin. Be sincere for the sake of Allah. So renew your intentions and over time put a lot of thought and reflection and deliberation into why you're doing what you're doing and develop that. Yes, you start with that in the beginning. Somebody might be saying, but I thought you set your intention before you do something. That's exactly what Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala is trying to teach us in the Ihya when he talks about the subject is that you've, you think through your intention while you're doing something before you do it, but then you have to continue working on it throughout the deed and even look back and reflect back on it once you're done with the deed. And that's how you achieve sincerity. We keep trying to approach sincerity like it's a magic pill. Like it's some just, you know, cheat code that you just punch in before you play the game to unlock something. That's not how sincerity works. You're going to have to work on it all throughout. And that's why I put it down here at number five. We're going to continue working on it every day. Just the why. I'm doing this for Allah. I'm doing this for Allah. I'm doing this for Allah. And you know what happens? About a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks, maybe four weeks into the year, you're going to deal with the situation. You're going to face some circumstances that are going to make you question why you're even doing what you're doing. And that's going to be the time where that sincerity kicks in. Number six, Tawbah and Istighfar. A tawbah to al-istighfar. Tawbah and istighfar. Right? Istighfar means to ask Allah for forgiveness. The Prophet in an authentic narration says he would do istighfar, he would ask Allah for forgiveness more than a hundred times a day. More than a hundred times a day. So ask Allah for forgiveness every day. And tawbah is a ruju ila Allah, to go back to Allah. Whenever we mess up, we do tawbah. Whenever we make a mistake, we say, oh Allah, I messed up. I'm not going to do that again. And you think about what you did wrong. You admit to Allah you did wrong. You feel bad for what you did wrong. And then you make a, an intention. You set your goal to change that going forward. But we have to keep up with that. Why? The Prophet says, an informative statement. The Prophet tells us a fact. Human beings make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Human beings are not perfect, cannot be perfect. But, the best of those make, who make mistakes are the ones who repent, the ones who correct their mistakes, the ones who fix their mistakes. So we're going to fix our mistakes. And number seven is al muhasaba. Al muhasaba. We need to incorporate the practice of al-muhasaba. Al-muhasaba basically means evaluation. We evaluate. We, Whenever we finish a day, whenever we finish a week, whenever we finish a month, whenever we finish a task, whenever we transition from one particular circumstance to another, and maybe even at the end of the year, we will re-evaluate. We will assess and reassess how things went. And this is that very famous concept of muhasaba, accounting oneself, right? That Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu has a very famous statement about that hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu, that account yourself and evaluate yourself before you are evaluated. So you have the opportunity to do a self-evaluation before you get evaluated by someone else. You can take a practice test before you got to give the final exam to see how you do. And that's something that we need to incorporate more and more and more. And that's something we need to be working on constantly so that we are able to. So these are seven items, hopefully not a whole lot, something that everyone can remember that's I very humbly would suggest these are things that I'm thinking about, things that I'm developing a framework for myself uh, for. And it can be a very helpful way to go into 
the coming calendar year, and that is gratitude, have high aspirations, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very diligently and consistently and regularly, very specifically and explicitly. Number three, uh, number four, excuse me, is consistency. Being regular and consistent with things. Trying to find that, trying to establish that. Number five, renew your intentions and establish sincerity. Think about why you're doing what you're doing. Number six, tawbah and istighfar. Ask Allah for forgiveness and repent and correct in your mind, in your heart, whenever you make a mistake. And number seven, muhasaba, account yourself, evaluate yourself, assess yourself. I pray and I hope that inshallah, um, this is helpful to all of y'all. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings for the previous year and allow us to learn and grow from the experiences of the previous year. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us in the coming year and make it a year of goodness and khayr and blessings. I mean, ya rabbal alameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Barakallahu feekum. As the sister mentioned, as a moderator mentioned, uh, obviously this is a... Friday reflection, uh, it does not stand in place of or substitute the khutbah in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so, inshallah, if you have gone to the masjid or are going to the masjid to pray Jumu'ah in congregation, that's beautiful. If for whatever reason, due to your circumstances, you are not able to go to the masjid for the Jumu'ah prayer, uh, then I hope and pray that this helped uh, provide a little motivation and perspective for your Friday. But please do make sure to pray Salat al-Dhuhr for Raka'az al-Dhuhr prayer. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakallahu khair and Sheikh Abdul Nasir. Um, and yeah, reminder to everybody that uh, we will begin our Q&A session shortly, inshallah. If you want to submit your questions, you can do so in the chat room on YouTube or just in the Facebook comments. Or if you'd like to submit it anonymously, just go ahead and email us at info at celebratemercy.com. Um, and we'll take your questions there, inshallah. Um, but Sheikh, I have the first question for you, um, which is related to the topic of setting goals. This person is asking, how do we find the balance between setting goals that are too easy or too unachievable? That's a very good question. Too easy or too unachievable. So I'm pretty sure that there are probably some people that could um, elaborate on that a little bit more uh, in depth uh, and maybe a little bit more kind of, you know, precisely. Um, I will share more so in the realm of just kind of lessons learned and uh, just some reflections that. While it it is true that they talk about setting lofty goals and having lofty aspirations, shoot for the stars, aim for the sky, and all of that good stuff, um, it can actually be, and more often than not, is usually pretty demoralizing for people uh, when they'll set, you know, a goal that is. You know, just based off of our human calculation, like very, very, very far out of reach. Nothing's impossible for Allah. We always affirm that. But it's from a human point of view, it's really far out of reach. It can be very demoralizing. It can be very kind of self-defeating. So you want to be a little bit more careful with that. Now, somebody says, but if you don't set very lofty goals and you're going to achieve whatever goals you set and then you're done. No, because once you achieve your goal, if you say, hey, all right, this is great. Um, now I'm just going to set another goal. So if you set a goal for yourself that you end up achieving in March, well, then you just set up the next level, 2.0, right? So, um, and that brings me to the second part of the question that maybe setting goals that are not too, um, you know, too far out, but are very, uh, you know, attainable and almost very easy goal setting for yourself. There's something, a lesson that I particularly learned about this, and that is uh, one victory leads to the other. You can never, right? Nobody gets, nobody ever gets tired of winning, as they say. 
you know, when when I, I use a lot of sports analogies, it's just a, a problem I have. It's something I grew up with. But, um, you know, no team ever gets tired of winning. They do get tired of losing. And then they start to get upset and they start to infight and all those things. But winning teams are, they look like they're having a party. They look like they're having fun. So that's where I would say is kind of setting easy goals for yourself. As long as then you will set subsequent goals. When you achieve one win, you'll say, okay, now you're going to start looking for the next win and the next win and the next win. But sometimes achieving wins can actually grow your ambition, right? So that would be just some personal advice uh, in that regard. Wallahu ala. Thank you. And um, we actually have a, I think this will be a quick question. Somebody is asking, um, well, they're saying we do Jum'ah at our home. So they, I think they watch the virtual Jum'ah khutbah from the masjid. And this brother is asking, once we finish the Jum'ah khutbah, do we make two rakahs or regular Dhuhr prayer? So I would need to know a little bit more about the circumstances, but basically there is an opinion, right, from the Hanafi school that does say that if there are four adult males in a home, if there are four adult males, right, so there's, you know, maybe a grandfather, father, and then two sons who are of adult age or past the age of puberty, uh, then actually potentially you could be doing the Jum'ah prayer, two rakahs of Jum'ah prayer. But typically for most folks, when you get done watching the Jum'ah broadcast or whatever it is, you typically will be praying four rakahs with the intention of Dhuhr. Worry not if it is due to health circumstances and situations and restrictions and whatnot, you get your reward. You get your reward. Allah is most kind and most generous and most merciful. You get your reward. But technicalities are important to pay attention to. Fiqh is very important to abide by. And so for most folks, what you want to do is you get done watching the broadcast and you pray for a cause of Dhuhr prayer. There could be some situations where there's a larger kind of an extended family, maybe living together. Or there's a lot of men folk in the home, right? There's three, four adult sons and a father and a grandfather or something like that. Then in those situations, according to the Hanafi school, they are actually able to conduct the Jum'ah prayer for themselves because there are at least four adult males. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Allah knows best. Great. Jazakallah khairan. And um, this is also a question related also to goals and a common goal that a lot of us set, which is um, Quran memorization. And this brother, Abdurrahman, is asking, what recommendations or strategy do you have for someone wanting to memorize the Quran later in life? Ah, later in life. There is no such thing as later in life. All right. That's not a thing. We refuse to accept the term later in life. Right. Uh, just just joking about that. Right. Because obviously you can see I'm a little bit there later in life. But um, no, I definitely understand your question, Brother Abdurrahman, that it can, you know, add certain challenges and it can be a little bit more difficult because, you know, a 10, 12 year old kid, you know, they got nothing to do but the work that's in front of them. You give them their schoolwork, their Quran memorization work, they don't have another worry in the world, right? But then, you know, if you're uh, 40 years old and you got bills to pay and mouths to feed and, you know, et cetera, et cetera then, you know, it can be a little bit more dif difficult and demanding. Um, and sometimes, you know, kind of your mental faculty and your ability to memorize and things like that can also be at a different pace. So what I recommend is, here's the thing. Number one is consistency is the name of the game. And I'm sorry for such a cliche, right? I'm sorry for such a cliche. But consistency really is the name of the game. So it does not matter, right? I, I see in the comments, Brother Rahman is mentioning he's 22 years old. So let's say you're going to school and you're working and, you know, you got some other responsibilities, you know, helping out around the house and stuff like that. And so you're only able to make an hour a day, 45 minutes a day to memorize. But logging those 45 minutes every single day is going to be really important. So really it comes down to consistency because it does not matter whether you finish memorizing in a year or 10 years or 30 years. I've known people, I've met people, two professors, they both were the heads of their department in a very uh, prestigious university, Muslim university. And uh, they both, when they kind of started 
you know, their academic careers, they both set a goal with one another that they would memorize the whole Quran. And they would only get about 20, 30 minutes every morning after Fajr in the masjid. They pray Fajr together in the masjid. Uh, they go to the same masjid for Fajr and then they sit there for 30 minutes and they memorize like a line or a verse or whatever. Um, and that's what they were able to do. 30 years later, both of them became Hafid of the Quran. When they retired from the university as professors, they were Hafid of the Quran. Uh, and they actually let Tarawi together like at the age of 70. Um, so it, it's, it, it doesn't matter, right? The kid who memorizes in a year, who's 10, 12 years old and going to class eight, 10 hours a day, um, it's every day though. The working professional or the college student, right? We have a lot of students at the seminary at Qalam who ended up memorizing Quran during college or they're even memorizing Quran while they're doing their Islamic academics and studies uh, at Qalam. Uh, they'll be memorizing. And um, so maybe it'll take three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, whatever. But they just, they have this consistent schedule. They got like, you know, 30 minutes, five days a week. And then the two days off, they log an extra hour, an hour and a half on Friday and Saturday. But that consistency is there. That's the point I'm trying to make, right? The example I gave you, somebody became half of over 30 years, right? They were logging 20 minutes every day for 30 years. So consistency is very, very important. That's the main thing. Then there's a lot other small things in terms of, you know, approach and specific kind of technicalities and things like that, uh, the, the, the methodology. But what I would recommend for that is get in touch with, even if it be long distance, right? Sending an email or making a phone call or whatever it is, get in touch with a HIFS teacher and tell them what kind of time frame you have. And then they can basically carve you up, um, you know, kind of a, a strategy to follow. But the biggest thing I can tell you right now is consistency is going to be the key to this. Inshallah. Inshallah. And uh, Brother Abu Ahmed, may Allah give you tawfiq to become a hafiz and all of us, inshallah. Um, so we have another, we have an anonymous question now. Um, the person asked, Jazakumullah khairan Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jainda for two beautiful talks. Can you please give advice to those who are in households where the family is not on the same spiritual course on how to keep motivated? It can be very difficult when you feel alone on your journey. Any advice or stories you can share to keep someone motivated who isn't feeling supported? SubhanAllah. Well, first of all, may Allah subhanahu wa make it easy for you. May Allah make it easy for you. I will tell you one thing right off the bat. Your situation is very difficult. It's very, very challenging. But at the same time, I also congratulate you because you now have something in common with people like Musa bin Umair. You know, you now have something in common with the great companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You now have something in common with great people like the Prophet Ibrahim Khalilullah alayhi salam. Right, people who had opposition and did not have support within even their own home and their own family. It's a very tough spot to be in, but it's also a very uh, rewarding position to be in. It's also a very lofty status to, uh, to have. And Allah never tests anyone beyond their capacity. And Allah never puts anyone in a situation that they're not able to handle. So it's also a great testament to how resilient of a person you are, how strong you are, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you in that situation. And you will be uh, an inspiration for so many other people. And in terms of Sharing some, you know, like I referenced historically all the example of the prophets and the sahaba, but to share with you a very um, practical example, one that I've interacted with. I still remember it was actually not too long before we went into the pandemic and, you know, things got kind of restricted and limited quite a bit. But I was invited a very, very dear friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, somebody that I've known now for almost 20 years. Um, and I think of him like a brother. He invited me to his home because his son had completed a reading of the Quran, the entire Quran from cover to cover 
with a teacher with proper tajweed. And he invited me over and my family over and a couple other families over and we listened to the young boy recite very beautifully and the teacher, you know, was there and made dua for the young boy and, you know, we all kind of shared a meal together and gave a little gift uh, to the young man and um, all of that. And it was a very beautiful kind of get together and celebration, if you will. Now, what's the big deal about that? Why do I share that with you? I shared that with you because the father of this boy, who this boy who just finished reading the Quran with beautiful recitation in Tajweed, the whole Quran from cover to cover, under the supervision of a teacher and was now starting the memorization of the Quran. The father of this boy, I said, I know I known him for 20 years. I met him when he became Muslim. I met him when he accepted Islam. And he was a young man himself at that time, fresh out of college. He was originally from Central Texas, came from a part of the country and a part of the state, a community and a family that was very, very kind of strict evangelical Christian. And we're talking 20 years ago when everyone... In, especially in those kind of parts of the country, there was a lot of uh, paranoia and a lot of misinformation about Muslims and Islam. And at college, at university, he came across Islam and read the translation of the Quran and found out more about Islam and realized he was Muslim. And he accepted Islam. And when he told his family, his family wanted to have nothing to do with him. And some of his family members said terrible, terrible things and basically completely rejected this. And he was very close with his family. And it's kind of like he just became isolated and alone overnight. But subhanAllah, shortly thereafter, he was able to meet his wife very, mashallah, amazing practicing Muslim sister. We became very, very close friends, like family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with beautiful children and a beautiful home and a beautiful family. Ultimately, eventually, even his own family became a lot more comfortable with Islam, so much so that his brothers started reading translation of the Quran and started considering Islam. And I was sitting there in his home, in his living room, listening to his son recite the Quran so beautifully that I imagined the children of the Sahaba, that's what they sounded like when they read the Quran. And I thought back to, I thought back to 20 years ago and where he was. So you find yourself in a difficult situation, but nobody knows where that story ends. I would say, hang in there. Be strong, have faith, stay committed, put your faith and trust in Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the friend of the one who has no friends. Allahu waliyu wa la wali May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you. Jazakallah khairan shaykh. And uh, we still have a few more questions and we have a few more minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to ask the next one and then... Uh, while you're thinking over an answer for this, I just want to share another announcement, inshallah. Uh, but the question is, do you have advice for tackling riyat or ostentation, especially if you do public work in the community? It makes it difficult to maintain sincerity. So while you're thinking about that, I just want to remind everybody that last night we live streamed the first session of our new Portrait of a Prophet course for free. So this is the first session of um, an extended version of this course. We've held the Shema'il course before, um, talking about the personality and beauty and characteristics of the Prophet Wasallam. This is going to be an extended version with 40 hours of live instruction over the course of about four months. And all the registrants will also have six months access to the recordings afterwards. So you can revisit recordings and catch up. Um, but the first session is free to watch on our YouTube channel if you want to check it out. And then if you want to go ahead and register for the full course, just go to celebratemercy.com slash portrait. 
We have scholarships available for those who need financial assistance. And also uh, when you go to sign up or if you just want to sponsor somebody else who may be in need of assistance, you can do that on the registration form as well. Just mention um, how many people you want to sponsor, how much you want to donate towards a sponsorship. Um, and inshallah, you can assist somebody else in attending the class and benefiting from it, inshallah. Um, but with that, Sheikh Abdul Nasser, I'll bring it back to you to answer this question. Absolutely. Um, the issue of Riyadh ostentation showing off and, you know, the struggle, fighting the struggle for sincerity um, is definitely a very challenging one and something everyone has to think about and work on. Um, but somebody asked specifically in light of, in the context of, if somebody does some kind of public work, right? Um, they do some kind of community work or some kind of general good in the community then how do they work on that? Well, first and foremost is, here's something interesting. Shaitan will try to come at you and will say, well, because you're kind of struggling with this idea of sincerity here, so until you have that perfect sincerity, you need to stop doing good whatever you're doing. That definitely is not the answer. Right, and there's many great scholars who have commented on this. Al Hassan Basri and Fudail bin Ayyad, and many many have commented on this that stopping good and quitting good out of the concern of sh showing off and not doing it for the right reasons is actually not sincerity, but that is even more problematic. That is even more problematic. Because now, once again, you've made yourself more important than the work you're doing. See, when you do good work for the community, you work for the deen, the problem of showing off comes in where you make yourself more important than the work. You make it about yourself and not about the work, not about the people that you're helping. So if I'm teaching this class and, you know, the, the, the compromise of intention is I make it more about myself than the message. That's a problem. But if I stop doing the good because I'm not sure about my intention, I once again have made myself more important than the work. So you don't actually stop the good that you're doing, but rather you fix your intention. And I know that sounds easier said than done, but you fix your intention. You got to, you know, for just as an expression, you got to kind of beat yourself up a little bit. You got to take a long, hard look in the mirror. You got to do a really thorough self-assessment and evaluation. You got to be really brutally honest with yourself and know where you stand. What is going on with me? And another thing that is very helpful. And once again, this has become kind of a cliche in our times and our culture and especially online conversations and this and that. But whether you call it a teacher or a mentor, having someone or some people in your life that can advise you, that can counsel you, that can correct you, that can be honest with you, that can point things out is very, very important. Very, 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 very important. And it cannot be replaced and it cannot be substituted. It just cannot. Um, and that's something that kind of honest Insight and feedback is very important. And you know, Imam Ghazali says, <laughs> giving advice and even you know asking for advice and all of that is very easy. And in fact, it even makes you sound very kind of sophisticated. <laughs> but what's difficult is taking that advice, accepting that advice, internalizing, internalizing that advice, working on that advice. Right? So between those two things, three things. Number one, do not stop doing the good that you're doing. Number two, be very critical, self-critical. Don't make excuses for yourself. I know that sometimes people can go to an extreme with that. But if you're doing public work, I'm telling you, do not pat yourself on the back. It's not a good idea. Be very self-critical. And number three is that um, have some people that give you good qualified feedback good qualified feedback and the reason why i say qualified is people that are further than you people that are more experienced than you people are better than you at what you are doing so if you're a student of knowledge it needs to be a senior scholar do not take feedback from people that are at the same level as you or even less than you 
you can take technical feedback from them in regards to this or presentation or that, but like your personal internal kind of like input, you don't get it from people that are at the same level as you or lower or even further behind you in that work, because then you're just going to get a lot of praise. You're not going looking for praise. You're looking for constructive, beneficial, critical feedback. And that must be qualified. That must be qualified. All right. Jazakumal khairan. Um, I think we'll end with this question, inshallah. This person said, uh, Assalamu alaikum. What are some ways that a person can, can overcome selfishness and miserliness slash strong attachment to material things? Mm. Very, very good question. There's a lot of different things that we can talk about here. You know, there's a, a reading of the Quran and making dhikr of Allah helps because obviously you got something bad there. You need something good to push out that bad. So a lot of remembrance of Allah and reading of the Quran helps. Uh, listening to the hadith and the advice of the Prophet about these things like miserliness and stinginess and hubb dunya and love of the world. But the big thing I will tell you, the big and critical and practical part of it that I'll tell you. So this is a bigger topic, but I'll tell you, I'll put the most emphasis on the critical and the practical part of it. And that is, it's like anything else that you've developed an unhealthy attachment to. And that is that you need to basically kind of remove it from yourself and you need to start weaning yourself off from it. So you need to part ways with it. You need to separate with it. Right. And what I'm basically saying is that if your money and your savings are becoming an obsession and you're just constantly obsessed with that, Right, there's nothing wrong with being financially smart and prudent and those things, but if it's becoming like an obsession, then you just need to make a donation. You donate some of that money, absolutely, and it's going to hurt and it's going to be painful, it's going to feel like you're cutting off a finger. But that's exactly what's going to make you realize that okay, I didn't need it and I didn't die without it. So separating yourself from the thing that you have developed an unhealthy attachment to, right? There's that old kind of famous uh, example and fable of uh, there was a woman named Layla and a man named Majnoon. Crazy because he was crazy about her. And um, he was obsessing over her. And finally, when he realized this is an unhealthy obsession and he wanted to separate from it, then basically he said, now I do not even walk by, I don't even walk down the street on which Layla's house is at. So in separating that thing that he became obsessed from, he said, I don't even walk on that street anymore. That's why Allah tells us about things like zina, fornication, adultery. La taqrabu zina. Don't even go near it. Um, so we have to start kind of excising that thing out of our heart. And that can only be done by giving. Wallahu a'ala.